Good morning, everyone. Uh, the recording just um, has just started. Welcome to this course on um, our study in Revelation. And Daniel, we right now in the book of Revelation, going through it um, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Uh, can we just pray together? And then we will get started. Thomas, would you be able to lead us in prayer, please? And we'll start. Or uh, 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 if uh, Thomas, your mic is not okay, then uh, Prince, you want to lead us in prayer? Joseph. God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Father. In this morning that you have given us uh, in our life, God, we pray that in this time and submit in your hand, Lord, help us to, as we're going to learn your word from the book of Revelation, Lord. And help us, uh, Holy Spirit, we need your help so uh, we can understand more and more and apply in our life also and so we can live life uh, with you, Lord. Thank you. I pray that all the students, all those, also I pray, Pastor, and all the internet, uh, internet connectivity, Lord, everything that you are working uh, fine, Lord. And it's time I submit all things in your hand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, once again. Uh, okay. So we have gone till uh, Revelation chapter 14 in our journey. And um, uh, just to quickly review a few things, a few things. Uh, Revelation chapter 11, 12, and 13, these three, are starting from the middle of the tribulation till the end of the tribulation. Revelation chapter 11 um, begins by telling us about the um, the temple being overtaken by the Gentiles and being desecrated. And it tells us about the two witnesses whom God sends and their ministry for the second half of the tribulation. That means from the middle of the tribulation to the end of it. Revelation 12, again, uh, is a description of what Satan does starting from the middle of the tribulation till the end of the tribulation. Basically, it says, you know, it talks about how Satan tries to go into heaven, uh, but he is stopped there by Michael and the archangels, sent out of, you know, just resisted. And so he comes back to the earth with great vengeance, knowing that he has a very short time. Revelation 13 is again talking about middle of tribulation, to end of tribulation, but the focus is on the Antichrist and the false prophet, what they do during that three and a half year period. And we saw that uh, it describes to us uh, this Antichrist taking, I mean, having a lot of influence over the nations of the world and um, uh, he de demanding worship, wanting to be worshipped, but of course, the Antichrist is backed by the dragon. So when people worship the the beast or the Antichrist, they're actually worshiping the dragon or Satan. We saw that uh, he introduces a financial system or a currency system, forcing everybody, um, and also an identification system so that everybody has to have the mark of the beast or the number of the beast on the hand or on their forehead. And only if they have the mark, can they buy or sell. And then we also saw how there is this false prophet who's doing many signs and wonders and he's forcing, uh, he creates an image of the beast and he's making people worship that. So really, uh, Revelation 13 is talking about all you know, the control and the influence that the Antichrist and the false prophet have over the world. 
Revelation 14, we said, is a chapter of announcements. There are five angelic announcements that are made in chapter 14, which we saw last week. Um, we see in the beginning of chapter 14, the 144,000 Jews are taken into heaven. And then there's an angel that is proclaiming the everlasting gospel. There's another angel that's uh, announcing the fall of Babylon. There's a third angel. This is Revelation 14, 9, uh, which is warning people not to receive the mark of the beast. There's another angel, uh, Revelation 14, 14, that's announcing um, the great harvest of souls that is to come. And Revelation 14, 17, the fifth angel is announcing about the great judgment that is to come, the wine press uh, of the wrath of Almighty God. Right? And so that is where we stopped um, last week. And we are going to begin today in Revelation chapter 15. So here it is the beginning of the seven bowl judgments. So we've gone through the first two woes or sets of woes or rods or judgments. Now this is a third woe or the third set of judgment, which is the final set, final set. So this third verse is, is, you would say like, um, you know, uh, um, it's the final great judgment of God, set of judgments, basically. So that's um, um, getting ready to start in Revelation chapter 15. And uh, uh, so it says, you know, the Revelation 50 will tell us, okay, they're going to start these judgments. Uh, but then in between, it just shows us that there are more souls coming before God uh, during the tribulation. More people are being killed and they're coming before the presence of God. And then we get into Revelation 16, which is, it tells us what each one of those seven judgments are in this third woe or the third set of judgments, Revelation 15 and 16. So let's begin to read, please. Um, we will just read uh, Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 to 4 to begin with. Somebody could read that, please. Revelation 15, 1 to 4. All right. Revelation 15, uh, 1, to 4. 1 to 4. Then I saw another sign in heaven and marvelous, seven angels having the seven lost plates, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb say, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Mm. So, verse 15, John is saying, seven angels, they are ready. They are the seven last plagues. So these are the seven last judgments. And it says, in them the wrath of God is complete. Revelation 15, 1. So this is the final set of judgments that are going to be poured out on the people. So while he's seeing these seven angels that are ready to carry out these judgments or pour out these judgments on the earth, the scene changes and he sees the sea of glass. Remember the sea of glass is, um, it's what John describes this whole at heavenly atmosphere before the throne of God. It's like a sea of glass, meaning it's so vast, but it's so clear. Now, uh, I don't, think it's a physical layer of glass that people are standing on, but it's just that heavenly atmosphere, heaven, that, um, that 
uh, that John sees. It's a sea of glass mingled with fire. That's that's how he captures what he's seeing, and we just have to imagine it. It doesn't mean literal this fire burning. It just he's saying it's it's something so so clear, so pure, refined. That presence before the throne of God, that heavenly atmosphere, sea of glass, and fire. That's how he's describing what he's seeing in front of the throne of God. And then he says, he saw the people. He saw the people who have victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass. That means in this heavenly atmosphere. And they are worshipping God. So what does this tell us? It tells us that there will be lots of people in the second half of the tribulation after this Antichrist introduces his, you know, his, uh, this whole uh, people having to receive his image and his mark, uh, receive his image. And after they introduce this whole thing of having to worship this image of the beast, there will be lots of people who say, we don't want that. We are believers in Jesus Christ. And so they're going to die. They're going to be killed. But in their death, they're having victory. It says, those who have victory over the beast. This is verse 2. Remember, you know, in Revelation 12, 11, it says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony, and they lo loved not their lives unto death. So they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb, by the word of the testimony, and they also overcame in death. That means they died, but their death was a victory. Because they died refusing to receive the mark of the beast. That's what he's saying here. Those who have victory over the beast, Revelation 15 too. So even in death, there is victory. Victory over uh, the devil. So they died victorious. Because they refused the mark of the beast. They refused to worship the image of the beast. And they were standing in this heavenly atmosphere that seems like a sea of glass and fire. They're standing there, they're worshiping God with the harps in their hand. And they're singing the song of Moses. And these are the words, right? Beautiful words. Great and marvelous are your works. Great and marvelous are your works. And we can say that of God even now, even today. You know, we can uh, sing the song of Moses. So, I mean, there's these words, we can sing it. Lord, great and marvelous are your works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship before you. All nations shall come and worship for you, right? So we can just worship God even with these same words. Can you imagine? These are the words that are being used in heaven to worship God. And these are the same words we use today on earth to worship God. So what a privilege it is that we could use these words to worship God you know whether in heaven or on earth we can sing the same song we can use the same words to worship God you know so sometimes we think oh when I get to heaven it'll be such a wonderful time of worship yes it is true because the whole atmosphere is different you know, we will be standing on the sea of glass and fire. We'll be standing in the very presence of God. And the atmosphere will be different. But we have the privilege of using the same words today here on earth to worship God as we would be in heaven. 
In other words, we can worship God. Uh, our worship of God can be glorious from earth while we are here today. In as much as it will be glory, it of course will be more glorious when we are in his presence. But what I'm saying is those words that we use are, on, are the same. We are describing or we are expressing we are adoring God. Great and marvelous are your works. We can say that. We will say that now and we will say it in heaven also. Great and marvelous are your works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways. God, I recognize your ways are just, righteous, fair, equity, just, and true. They're always truthful. They're always, you know, perfect. Just and true your ways, oh God. So he's seeing these people worshiping God. So let's read verses 5 through 8, please. Somebody could read that. Revelation 15, 5 through 8, the next set of verses. Revelation 15, 5 through 8. Prince, please. Chill. After this, after these things, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple come, come the uh, seven angels having the seven plugs clothed uh, in pure bright light and having their chest graded with golden fans. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden blows full of the word of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was lifted, uh, filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Mm. So, what is John saying? He's saying these seven angels come out of the temple. They're ready to do what they have to do, which is to pour out the seven bowls. And uh, one of the four living creatures who are next to the throne hand them these bowls, so to speak, meaning saying, okay, this is what you have to do. And then they are ready to pour out the wrath of God. Now, just some things that we notice here is the John says, I, I saw the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. So it's he's 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 looking into the temple. The temple is opened. Uh and it's it's talking about the tabernacle of the testimony. So this is having reference to the tabernacle of Moses. So when Moses was told to build the tabernacle, he was told to build it in a line or as a copy of what was in heaven. So what he built on earth was a copy of what was there up in heaven. So that's the tabernacle of testimony, making reference to the tabernacle of Moses. But what's in heaven is also called the same thing. It's a temple, of the tabernacle, of the testimony in heaven or the sanctuary. So he's seeing this tabernacle, heavenly tabernacle, with a real tabernacle. He's seeing that open and angels walking out of that tabernacle. And um, uh, these angels are clothed in pure white linen, bright linen and golden bands. So brightness and gold, brightness and gold, purity and divinity. So bright light, bright, pure bright linen or white, 
purity, gold, divinity, and showing that these in, these are pure and divine beings, spiritual beings, divine from God. So pure, bright linen, white, representing purity, golden bands, gold representing divinity from God, of God, belonging to God. And uh, the temple is filled, verse 8, is filled with the glory of God and from his power. The glory of God and from his power. In this particular case here in verse 8, he's saying he's seeing something like smoke. And sometimes, you know, you see the, the cloud uh, just showing, just this showing us the, pres the presence of God and the glory of God. Uh, and, and so even for us in the natural realm, there will be times when, you know, we may see something like this. These are uh, tangible expressions of the glory and the power and the presence of God a smoke or a cloud or, you know, some visible expression that uh, are visible, tangible expressions of the glory and the power of God. So these seven angels are ready to pour out the seven plagues. So now we get into chapter 16, which is just going to give us, the, you know, list these plagues one after the other. So literally, what you must keep in mind is that these plagues are being poured out in the second half of the tribulation. So they will continue up over. So although it's, you know, it's given to us as a, in, in sequence in one chapter, um, uh, uh, literally it's happening over time, one after the other. So by the time the seventh bowl, or the last bowl is poured out, which is to basically towards the end of this chapter 16, it is right at the end of the tribulation. We, we reach the end of the tribulation. And uh, along with that, as these seven bowls are being poured out, we're reaching the end of the tribulation, there are some um, huge calamities happening on the earth along with these seven judgments, which we will be reading, chapter 17 and 18 are describing two major catastrophic events happening on the earth, right at the time of the final bowl of judgment. So it's all happening together. Chapter 16, which is a sequence of judgments. By the time you reach the last seventh judgment, Revelation 17 and 18 are happening, you know, simultaneously. And then comes Revelation 19, which is the battle of Armageddon. Okay, so let's read now. Revelation 16 It's giving us sequentially what happens uh, as each of these seven bowls are poured out. So uh, may I request uh, versus somebody to read verses uh, 1 to 3, uh, Revelation 16, 1, 2, and 3, please. Dave, could you read that, please? Yes, sir. Then oh. I heard a loud voice. Okay. Yeah. Loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowls upon the earth, and a pool and a pool and lots of lots of Lots of soul came upon the man who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Hmm. Verse 3, then the second angel. Yeah. Then the second angel poured out uh, his soul on the sea and it became blood as of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. Hmm. So, okay, yeah, I see Dave's, uh, Dave doesn't, his mic, he's got a problem with his mic. That's fine, Dave. All right, so, thank, uh, so the angel, first angel pours out, and uh, what happens? The people, 
though everyone who's received the mark of the beast or worshiping the image of the beast, they get sores on their bodies. In other words, this is God's judgment for them for worshiping the beast, the Antichrist, which basically is worshiping Satan. Second angel is pouring out of wrath. It destroys all the life in the sea. The, the blood becomes like a dead man's blood. And the, that means life in the seas cannot be sustained. So you can imagine all the fish and all the creatures in the sea are killed. It says they die. Right? So destruction everywhere. Then uh, verses 4 through 7, the next third angel. Revelation chapter 16, 4 through 7. Kanan? Can you hear me? Yes, Kanan. Yeah, 4 to 7. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water. And they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood drink, blood to drink, for it is uh, their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord uh, God Almighty, true and uh, um, righteous, righteous are your judgments. Mm. Thank you. So the next judgment, third judgment, what, what happens? All the waters of the rivers and the springs become blood. And there's this angel who says, Lord, you are righteous, you are just for in doing this because the people have, they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. Right? So they have uh, spilled the blood. They have killed, basically. They have killed the saints and the prophets. And so now they are being made to drink blood. Yeah. So, and, and so it says, God, you are righteous and you are just uh, when you're judging the people. So, you know, when we read these judgments and we think, wow, this is really serious. I mean, everything in the sea is, is destroyed. The waters on the rivers and the springs are destroyed, are, are, are turned into blood. So obviously people can't drink anything. And uh, they have to drink blood, it says. And, but then the angel is saying, God, you are just. You're righteous in this judgment. Why? The people have done so wickedly. They've killed your saints and your prophets. And this is what they will reap. This is the judgment, the, pun, you know, the punishment for sin, for their wrongdoing. And so God is just. So in, in all of these judgments, God is being just. He is not being wicked. He is not being mean. It's judgment. This is what is due to the people for, for the works, for the wickedness that they have committed. So, could someone read for us verses 8 through 11, please? The next two judgments. Revelation 16, 8 through 11. Kiran? Yes, sir. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they bless him. The name of God who has power over these looks, and they did not repent and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they they named their tongues because of the pain they blessed the god of heaven because of their pains and their source 
and did not repent of their deeds. Mm. Mm. So next to fourth and fifth, there is the the sun becomes really hot. The sun becomes really hot, and uh, you know just uh, scorching the people. Uh, but people blaspheme God. They they speak, you know, evil towards God. They don't repent. And the next one is this complete darkness in uh, the kingdom or in the regions of uh, where the beast, beast has his influence and uh, and um, it's full of darkness. It says, and the people again they blaspheme God. They do not repent of their deeds. So this is terrible, you know, climactic conditions, whether there's too much heat or it's complete darkness. So terrible conditions. And um, people are blaspheming God, meaning they're getting angry. They are, you know, trying to be, uh, not. they are being uh, rebellious against God. There's no repentance, right? In spite of all the judgments, and they're speaking uh, uh, against God. So now we come to the last two, the final two judgments that are going to be poured out. Uh, Revelation, the 16th chapter. Uh, can somebody read verses 12 to 16? This is the sixth angel. Revelation, chapter 16, verses 12. To 16. Somebody could read it. Um, Aaron has just dropped off, so uh, maybe we could have um, Thomas uh, could read it for us, please. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river of Euphrates. His water was dried up so that the, the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like of frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of the demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. Lest the walk naked and they see his name. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Mm -hmm. So now what's happening is the, um, let me just, let's see, what? Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm just, I was just writing some notes here. Um, So now, uh, this, in this judgment, that's the sixth one, when the angel, sixth angel pours out the bowl, the river Euphrates is dried up. So that whole space is uh, dried. But the main thing that we must understand is, it's talking about kings, verse, verse 12, Revelation 16, verse 12. Kings from the east are going to move in. And there are unclean spirits that go out of the mouth of, out of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. And these spirits of demons, they go out to the kings of the whole earth, the, the leaders of the whole earth, and gather them to battle for the great day of God Almighty. So what's happening? Revelation 16, 12, and 12 to 14. In the sixth judge bowl of judgment, something is happening. The bad preparation is beginning to happen for the battle of Armageddon. And Kings of the East, referring to the leaders, the 
the leaders from the east, east of Israel. So when you look at east of Israel, well, you know, you find Arab nations, uh, north, east, Iran, Iraq, you go up, Russia, further east, China. So a lot of these countries, east of Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, north, east, Jordan. So east of Israel kings from the east so there is this whole movement of armies from the east and it in fact says of the whole world that is verse 14 so the, there are these demonic spirits that are being released on the earth by the dragon that's satan through the beast and the false prophet who are instigating or mobilizing or moving world leaders to begin to come towards Israel for the battle of Armageddon. They're beginning to move their troops that way, right? So, I mean, if you want to look at, uh, just as an example, like I'm not saying that this is the battle of Armageddon, but if you look at what uh, the Russian president Putin did, he moved all his troops, not all his troops, but a large number of troops, about 100,000, sometimes some estimates say 200,000 troops, and circled Ukraine by land and also by sea. Right? So he began to, he moved on. Now, initially, people didn't think, at least U Ukraine didn't think he was planning to attack. He was just saying, no, no, we're just doing military exercises and all that. But actually, his plan was to attack. He began to mobilize his troops and surrounded Ukraine. Now, you can think about how the Battle of Armageddon is going to be. Kings from all, they're all coming. There are people from the east, you know, so the armies are going to build up. There are going to be armies from other parts of the world coming all towards this battle of Armageddon. Now, when we look uh, in the scriptures, um, you know, what is what instigates or what causes the battle of Armageddon? Um, if you turn with me to the book of Joel, so keep your hand here in Revelation 16. And you keep turn with me, please, to the book of Joel, chapter 3. So if you could just go with me to Joel. Chapter 3, Daniel, Hosea, and Joel. Joel chapter 3. If you look at verses, verses 1 and 2. Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Could somebody read that, please? At the time of those events, says the Lord, when I restored the property of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather the armies of the world into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Mm. There I will judge them uh, for harming my people, my special position, for scattering my people among the nations and for dividing up my land. They cast. Mm. That's right. Thank you. So you see there, Joel chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And, and, and you know, we, we can read this whole chapter. Um, so, But let's just look at some of the things. Uh, in, in, in verse 1, God is saying, I'll bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. So God has, has brought, he has brought his people back um, to their land. So that verse 1 has been fulfilled. Next, what's going to happen? Verse 2. He says, I will gather all nations and bring them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That is, he's bringing them to the battle of Armageddon, which we just read in Revelation 16, 12 to 14. And I will enter into judgment with them there because uh, of my people, because of what they've done to my people. And notice one of the things he says, they have also divided up my land. 
they have also divided up my land. So one of the things, one of the reasons that's going to lead to this bad build up in the battle of Armageddon, based on Joel chapter three, verse two is, they're going to divide up the land. So, you know, if you, if you look at the political situation, the scenario, what's going on right now is um, Israel has its land and on both sides, uh, there are the Palestinians and they have the small portions of land. Now, by all means, you know, uh, they, they definitely need their place to stay. Uh, but there's so much of dispute between Israel, Palestinians over who has the right to that land, right? The, the, the fight is going on. It's been going on for some time. And um, there's till now, there's been no resolution to that. Israel continues to encroach on the land where the Palestinians are in the sense of building their settlements and so on. And um, uh, they, they, you know, every now and then you hear about some, some, flare up some fighting happening uh, based on this whole uh, the whole problem is Palestinians want to be there Israel says that's our land now based on Joel 3 verse 2 it says they have also divided up my land it seems that one of the things that are going to lead to this nations gathering together because he says I will gather all nations this nation is beginning to come together um, to the valley of Jehoshaphat to the to fight this battle of Armageddon has to do with the dividing up of the land right that's Joel chapter 3 verse 2 so we have to observe and watch what is happening you know uh, how the whole interaction is proceeding because Joel 3 verse 2 is telling us the reason the nations are going to gather together in the Valley of Jehoshaphat is because there's going to be a division of the land. Now, obviously, there are some who would say, yeah, the land must be divided. And there are some nations who say, no, the land must not be divided. It belongs to Israel. So there's going to be this big dispute that's going to precipitate into this whole gathering together of the nations, right? Now, can we also read, please, Joel chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Somebody could read that, please. Joel 3, 11 and 12. Joel 3, 11 and 12. Come quickly, all you nations, everywhere gather together in the valley and now O oh lord call out your warriors let the nations be called to arms let them match to the valley of Jehoshaphat. there i the lord will sit to pronounce judgment of them all hmm. right so it's it's telling us again you know about this this whole build-up for this Battle of Armageddon, you know, the nations, come on, you, the nations are going to be awakened. So it's almost like there's going to be a stirring revelation. So basically, I'm, I'm explaining further Revelation 16, 12 to 14, right? Sixth angel has poured out the bowl. And what is that about? It's about nations being coming together, coming against each other, getting preparing for battle, preparing for war, right? Now, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39 so keep so you know uh, revelation 16 has many references back in the old testament joel chapter 3 ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 and also zechariah chapter 13 all of these are uh, uh, kind of related to um, uh, Zechariah chapter 14. Yeah. Uh, the, the, it's, they're all related to Revelation 16, 12 to 14, this 
battle of Armageddon and how the nations will prepare themselves for this battle. Right? So if you turn with me to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, sorry, not Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, 38 and 39. Ezekiel, 38 and 39. Can somebody read for me, read, please? Um, you know, you can read this whole chapter, Ezekiel chapters, Ezekiel 38 and 39, and they're describing this, what will happen, the sequence of events in this battle of Armageddon. But um, let us just read Ezekiel 38, 1 to 11, and then I'll just point out a few other verses. Uh, Ezekiel 38, 1 to 11, could somebody read that, please? Yes, I'll read it. Okay, go ahead. Ezekiel 38, 1 to 11. This is another message that came to me from the Lord, son of man, turn and face God of the land of Magog, the prince who rules over the nations of message and the double and prophecy against him. Give him this message from the sovereign God, God, uh, God, I am your enemy. I will turn you around and put hooks in your Jews, Jews to lead, lead you out with your whole army, your horses and chariots in full armors of a great horde, armor with the shield and stored. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya will join you to, with all their weapons. Gomer and all its armies will also join you along with the armies of Beth, Jogar, Mah from the distant north and many others. Get ready, be prepared, keep all the armies around you mobilized and take command, command of them a long time from now you will be called into action in the distance future you will be swapped down on the land of israel which will be enjoying place after recovering from war and after its people have returned from many lands to the mountain of israel you and all your allies a vast and awesome army will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. This is what the sovereign Lord says at the time evil thought will come to your mind and you will devise a wicked same. You will say Israel is an unprotected land filled with the unveiled villages i will match against her and destroy these people who who live in such confidence mm, mm. so you know it, it's very interesting to read ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 i'll encourage you to read it now ezekiel is prophesy now you say, okay, you know, uh, uh, what time period is he referring to? And that answer is in verse 8. He's saying, in the latter years, that means somewhere out in the future, this is going to happen. And he mentions many tribes and peoples, you know. So if you go to Ezekiel 38, verse 2, he talks about Gog and Magog, the prince of Rosh. And now... You know, I'm not a scholar in tribes and those kinds of things. So these are things that I just take from uh, uh, Bible scholars or people whom I trust. Uh, and, and, and from what I, my reading of their, uh, their writings, uh, they are referring, so he, they mentioned that these tribes and these peoples are referring to, um, so for Gog and Magog, the Prince of Rosh, Russia. Meshach and Tubal, Tubal and uh, uh, Rosh, Meshach and Tubal are referring to tribes that are in Russia. And then verse 5, Persia, 
of course, Persia we know for sure, it refers to Iran and Iraq, Arab nations, Ethiopia and Libya, Arab nations. Uh, Gomer, they say, refers to Eastern people in Eastern Germany. Now, I'm, I'm not sure where they are, how they are, but all of these nations come into an alliance. So Russia, uh, Iran, Iraq, Arab nations, uh, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, so these nations are being moved against Israel. And this is in the latter years. And it says here in verse 10, you know, uh, sorry, in verse 8, God says, I have gathered Israel, my people, on the mountains of Israel. So that has happened. God's people have come back to their land in the latter years. This, this has happened. But then it says, these countries, these nations, an evil thought will come into their mind. So Russia, Gog and Magog and Rosh, they're going to lead this. They're going to have this thought, hey, these people are living there. I'm going to go against them. Right? Uh, and then just look quickly with me a few verses. Oh, actually, we've already gone into our break time. All right. Uh, so let's take our break. I'll come back and I'll just highlight a few things in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, I would encourage you to read these two chapters a little later because it's it's giving us details on how this battle of Armageddon is going to take place. And it's quite interesting to read. Okay, let's take a break. We'll come back in 10 minutes and continue. Thank you. <laughs> 